preparing to be dominant and then have it suddenly end. I don't know if he's happy about that or sad about that. I think he's tired. I think he really wishes he could retire, but he doesn't know how to do it yet. And I don't think he wants to leave it where it is right now. If he could win a major and walk away, he would, I think. The thing is, I love him so much that I can't tell him you're not going to be great again. Skip, how do you mm. feel about Tiger after reading this article? Oh, man. Stephen A., we've talked and talked and talked about Tiger Woods. We talked about a lot of these themes that Wright Thompson dealt with in this terrific piece. I, I guess I'm supposed to feel sorry for Tiger, but I got to be honest, I don't. I don't feel one ounce of sympathy after reading what came off to me as a very sad portrait of a very lonely man who can't come to grips with the fact that it's over for him being a dominant golfer. Can't accept it, can't, can't live with it just yet. And those. Those are some poignant quotes from Michael Jordan, who still obviously loves the man he calls teed up, Tiger Woods. And a major theme in Wright's piece is one that, that we've discussed several times on the show, that after Tiger lost his father, he lost his only confidant. He, he lost his shield. He, he lost his safe haven. He lost the man who sort of engineered Tiger Woods, if you will. Who, who built and constantly fueled Tiger's invincible confidence. And I'm going to say it again. For those three years in there, 99, 2000, 2001, Tiger Woods dominated this sport the way no one, I believe, will ever again dominate it. And then, as we know, it all suddenly fell apart. And the other theme here is that, that Tiger's described in the piece as this socially awkward nerd as he sort of came into being as the Tiger Woods we all knew from a distance. And this socially awkward nerd wanted to be his father ultimately. And after he lost his father, he, he wanted to be the, the, the Earl Woods who became, a, a you know, Earl was obviously a career military man who fought two tours of duty in Vietnam. So Tiger wanted to be, again, as we've talked about many times on the show, a Navy SEAL. And in, in doing so, he, he went through, through all kinds of drills with the Navy SEALs and, and he, he wrecked his body along the way. Again, we think he tore his ACL. In, in some kind of maneuver with the Navy SEALs. And then he wanted to become Earl Woods' father to the point that, like Earl, who was a rampant womanizer by many accounts, Tiger became a rampant womanizer through that period of his life. And some of the, a couple of last great anecdotes that Wright Thompson provided. The younger Tiger Woods once went to a nightclub with Derek Jeter and Michael Jordan. Now, that's some company at a nightclub. And as Derek and Michael were chatting up some of the more beautiful women at the nightclub, Tiger asked them, how do you, how do you talk to girls? How do you talk to girls? Tiger Woods asked them. And Michael looked at Tiger and said, you, you just tell them you're Tiger Woods. You'll be good after that. You know, like, that, that's all you, you need to them. say. That, that'll break the yeah. ice, right? And, and then the final anecdote that, that sort of sticks with me is Tiger so admired the Navy SEALs and again wanted so badly to become one and so after going through maneuvers with them by day they went to dinner at night at a restaurant and the check came and there was silence at the table as the SEALs expected Tiger Woods who's got a few bucks to pick up the check Silence. And finally, one of the SEALs said, according to Wright, we'll have separate checks. And the waitress was just sort of dumbfounded for a second and then turned and walked away. And there's some scathing quotes from one of the SEALs who just said, weird dude, you know, we were out on Tiger after that. And that's how it kind of leaves me flat reading this piece. I'm just out on Tiger Woods. I loved watching him. I miss him. I got no sympathy for him. Well, that last part is what garners the least amount of sympathy more than anything yeah. else. You admire these men who obviously represent our country in a phenomenal fashion. You admire all the things that they endure, what they put themselves through in order to be elite um, in what they do. You train with them. You ask them out to dinner. They come out to dinner with you, and then you're looking for others to pick up the check. Oh, when you're worth bad. at that's least bad. a half a billion dollars, yep. that's just 
bad and pathetic on so many levels um, it, they, 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 that, you know, you, it doesn't warrant any sympathy whatsoever. It's inexcusable, okay? It's inexcusable. With that being said, I'm very, very surprised, and I haven't finished reading the entire piece, Skip. I've gone through, my, I guess, half of it. I will tell you that none of it really surprises me. Uh, the part about him being out with Michael Jordan and Derek Jeter, uh, that, that doesn't surprise me at all because, you know, I, I don't care how bad you are. You ain't Derek Jeter and you ain't Michael Jordan. Yep. I don't care who you are. You know, they, 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 these brothers are on another level. But having said all of that, Let's be clear about something. What really is going on here is not about Tiger Woods um, struggling with not being the elite golfer anymore. What's really going on here is that not being the elite golfer eradicates the one thing he had to lean on to gloss over all of his other deficiencies. And now you have nothing to do that. That's what's really going on here. Tiger Woods, as I've said on many occasions, wasn't just trying to be an elite golfer. He was trying to be that iconic figure, comparable, if not one who, dare I say, usurped the greatness of a Michael Jordan in terms of not just his performance on the field of play, but also as somebody you wanted to come into your home. He was Madison Avenue. He was the guy that white, black, Hispanic, Catholic, Jewish, whomever would want coming to their home to sit down for dinner at them, or who, who a father would want to marry his daughter, or whatever. These were the kind of images he adroitly went about the position of manufacturing and then disseminating to the masses. Yep. And in 2009 and Thanksgiving, all of that was shattered. And because of it, he has no place to hide. So he's got his private jet and his private yachts and it's very nondescript with the license plates that give no indication whatsoever of who exactly it, it owns the thing. And, you know, you got Jordan and his jet that's painted in Carolina blue with, with, with 23 six on it and what have you. you we, the six for the titles, the 23 was his jersey number. You got Jack Nicholas with his NJ1 or whatever it was on his, you know, you know, you know for his plane. You got all of this stuff going on. You didn't know any of that about Tiger Woods because Tiger Woods wanted to operate in the dark. He wanted to move slickly and slyly through life where he projected a certain image and how he lived was completely different and yeah. no one knew anything. That's what he wanted. And once it became exposed, once he became exposed, he's open and he can't take it. Yeah. Because now... Everyone's looking at him. And if it was just about your old and injuries have, have beaten you down and father time and age and attrition have beaten you down and you can no longer play golf, but we still love you, you're yep. still special, you're still Tiger, Tiger Woods would be just fine. Yep. It's the fact that he's not because people don't look at him that way and don't have the level of love and affection for him that they once had, they did. at least in his mind. No. It's that combined with his golf game not being able to protect him from that shrapnel of cynicism. That is what has Tiger Woods in this state. Yep. Jordan don't have to worry about I that. I agree. Jeter don't have to worry about that because everybody loves them. Yeah. Everybody don't love Tiger no more. I've told and you before that so much animosity was generated and then directed back at Tiger because he and his people had done an almost miraculous job of selling him, portraying him as the perfect husband and the perfect father as his daughter and son were born. And then for this to come crashing down, and I, I, I always refer to my mom here, she was such a huge Tiger fan, and it just shook her at her foundation to think, oh, oh I, I was duped. It was, I was a lie. Yeah, authentic. it was, it was well, a lie. Yeah. Well, here's the reality. The people who carefully crafted and manufactured yep. or facilitated manufacturing the image that Tiger Woods had, let's call them what they are. They're Hall of Fame liars. Yep. That's who it. they are. I agree. The difference is, the difference is, is Tiger is the one 
that has to bear the consequences. So let this be a lesson to professional athletes. Being private and real is entirely different than being private and fake. Mm. Michael Jordan is a lot of things. He ain't fake. <laughs> Derek Jeter's a lot of things. Yeah. He ain't fake. Yeah. Tiger Woods, in the eyes of a lot of American folks, are, he's fake. And those people who he leaves responsible for crafting his image, although they did their job, yep. they're professional liars. They're Hall of Fame liars. That's yep. what they are. And I know money isn't everything, but on the bright side, he earned 50 million last year, ninth highest paid athlete, and is reportedly worth, according to Forbes, 700 million. Money can't buy your love. I was love. just going to say, or yep. happiness. In most cases. Nope. Yeah. Mm -hmm. nope, not at all. Sam Bradford, he got paid, but he's reportedly not happy with the Eagles right now. They just moved up in the draft to likely take a quarterback, but did they give up too much? Lewis Riddick back at the desk to join us for that debate. Stay here. It'd be a